Man, that looks good. Jesus. Well, I mean, I guess first and foremost, you know, it started with how are we going to get our foot in the door? You know, no, nobody knows about us. Um, we probably shouldn't do a fancy, you know, high-end concept. You know, what can we do that, you know, um, that's approachable, that makes sense to us? And really, Delhi came out, because Delhi is what we had a lot of passion for. Delhi with seats. We'll do something at night, we'll figure it the out. At night, we'll figure something out. Yeah. We'll just cook some stuff. So, which is exactly what it is. I mean, the format is you yeah. come here by day, and it's a relatively modest, tightly scoped lunch menu, which is fantastic sandwiches. I mean, great stuff, great side dishes, great vegetables, real simple. Kind of harkens back to all of our Italian-American youth, but ups, ups it with great ingredients and obviously your technique behind it. And then dinner becomes, you come in and the menu's on the wall and it's a set menu, $50 a person. Apps come out, boom, 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 boom. Choice of a couple of entrees. And every day it changes, or, or with the market it changes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And we go to the green market as often as we can. Our fish purveyor tells us what he caught. We figure it out from there. Um, often we just, we'll just buy something and, you know, round table. What are you doing with watermelon today? What are you doing with watermelon today? I don't know, we'll figure it out. Watermelon, it's in season, use it. You know, and that's how we come up with it. And we pull from, uh, from these ingredients that are, you know, things that we say are ours. You know, ingredients that are ours. Frank's Red Hot, that's ours. You know, yeah. B&G peppers, those are ours. You Ricotta. know, ricotta from Dancing You, upstate New York. And, and that's how we make our Italian food, you know. And, that is Italian food. I don't care who you are, what you say, you know. Italian food is using the ingredients that are around you, immediately around you, with their, with their techniques and that spirit with your ingredients. Italian food constantly changes. It, it, what you're doing is like the philosophy yeah. of Italian cooking, the which is how spirit. it is in Italy. The spirit, yeah. yeah. It's the same spirit and it's the same philosophy. That's why Mario makes an argument, we, we make an argument, that it's, that it's actually more Italian than an Italian guy cooking Italian food from yeah. Italy right here. Like what we're doing, could be considered more Italian. You got a fancy Italian restaurant and you're shipping burrata in from Naples when Lou DePaula makes it on Grand Street, you're phony. <laughs> so uh, tell, me, tell me what you're building here, Chef. This is uh, the broccoli rab, and it's sauteed broccoli rab, garlic, hatch chili, and then it's mixed with uh, California olive oil, salt, and our blend of B&G peppers. It's a hell spicy blend. Italian food is ingredient food. You know, it's about the ingredients, so that's why we try to make this place about, about about our ingredients. Yeah, that looks, that's sexy. All right, we're doing our, our boys up at Teresi, which is really cool. It's this Italian-American cooking that they're kind of inventing as they go, and I love the idea behind it. Um, so, so I thought we had to come down to Little Italy and visit an old friend of mine and probably yours, Lou DiPaolo, who runs this iconic cheese shop on the corner of Mott and Grand. Been here for generations. Uh, Lou's father had the business, I think his grandfather had the business, but it used to be a tiny little store. It was a cheese store where you came in and bought mozzarella and Italian specialties. Well, Lou is preparing this store for the next generation of DePaolo's, and to that end, he's expanded. Uh, his cheese store now has prepared foods to go, a much bigger selection. It's twice the size that it used to be, and just beyond, it's a beautiful little wine store that sells just Italian wines that his son Sammy's in charge of. Sammy goes back and forth to Italy all the time, so we're going to see what Lou's doing at his store, sourcing really all all Italian ingredients as well as prepared foods to go now and a great wine store right next to it in the heart of what's left of Little Italy. How many generations has the store been here? I keep forgetting. Well, I'm the fourth generation. Sam is the fifth. And we're, we're very, very proud of that. You know, 1910, my great-grandfather, Savino Di Paolo, who Sam is actually named after my father, who was named after uh, my great-grandfather, opened the first Latari, one of the first Latarias here in, in New York City's Little Italy. And uh, we've maintained that tradition, and we're very proud that my family continues. We, you know, my, my niece, my sister's uh, daughter works with us, my youngest daughter works with us, and... and uh, so you're going after the Mohicans, too. Well, right? you see how beautiful this is. It, it should have a little bit of that sheepish smell and flavor. I and mean, you see, properly aged, you're going to get a little bit of the crystallization like you do with well, with grana cheeses. That's right. Uh, the grape varietal, it's, uh, it's called Montonico, or in Greek, it, where it originates, Montonicos. Basically, the whole idea behind the Enoteca at the Palos is to offer our clients a good rounded knowledge on the wines that they're going to be buying. Uh, a typical Enoteca in Italy concentrate, focuses on their regional wines. For instance, in Piemonte, you'd find predominantly only Piemonte's wines in that store. 
and they could also refer you direct to that winery. They have that rapport with the producer. And here we offer that same service, only catering to all 20 regions of Italy. I think it's time for us to um, do some tastes. Absolutely. I'd like to start off with the 2005 vintage of the Monte di Grazia from Torre. Ideal for summer, warmer months. Very soft tannins. And juicy taste, character of the Tintore. Mm. It's delicious. We should also mention, you can't tell this from the camera, but this store is kept at cellar temperature. We're here in the heat, we're filming this in the heat of the summer, it's been one of the hottest summers on record in New York mm. City. And you walk inside the store and it's like 60 degrees, 62 degrees. At the maximum, it, would be, it won't exceed 62. So all the wine that's being sold, is being held, is shipped at this temperature right. and controlled at this temperature. Because up and down is one of the worst enemies for wine. Absolutely. If you fluctuate the temperature of especially a red wine uh, for one hour, it'll destroy the wine. It'll slow cook the wine or, or just bake it completely. I've done it many times. You know, it's a heartbreak. In houses, when you have wine, you didn't have a wine cellar, you didn't have a basement to keep them in, you have a great bottle of wine, you put it down, you go to drink it four or five years later, and so you, as soon as you open it, you're like, it's a gone, blend. gone. All right, so we've just walked up from Little Italy. You know, it's like a 10 minute walk from Little Italy to Nolita. So the Paolo, always wanted to see Lou. It's great to see that store expanding. He's one of the last of the Mohicans. Now we're gonna come back and see these guys take on Italian American cuisine. And as I mentioned, you know, place doesn't open until six, no reservations, blah, blah, blah. So you gotta wait every night, 5.30, 5.15, line starts to form. Six o'clock, they open the door, full seating right off the get-go. So the strategy is get here early. If you can't get a table, leave your name and you'll get in. You'll see why. So far we've seen lunch, now you're going to see dinner. It's just smoking, it's great. It's one of the best buys in town. Young guys, super ambitious. They've got their skin in the game, and they're cooking their hearts out. Let's go in and watch dinner. You ready? Chef, sat down last night. First thing I get, bang, garlic bread. Talk to me about what you're doing. This is the bread, that's obvious. What's the yes. schmear on top? Schmear is butter, uh, garlic confit puree, house dried oregano, ground chili flakes, um, and tomato powder. That's why it's that pink yeah. color. All right, it's, it's five minutes after six. There's been a line out the door for 45 minutes. They can't let everybody in all at once. You just can't do that, because it'll trash the kitchen. So they're kind of bringing them in in fours and twos and twos and fours. The dining room is full. Let's begin this party. Three bass on the board. Head of the way, good amount of sea salt. Fortune liquid is uh, butter, olive oil, white wine, crushed garlic and herbs. That smells good. It's gonna sit in here for about 45 minutes really slow, cook it probably about 80% of the way, and then we're gonna finish it in the oven when we pick it up. Mozzarella curd, right, Chef? Yeah. It's amazing, man. It's the first thing that hits your plate when you sit down here, one of the first wave of things, and it's just, it's insane. I mean, who makes mozzarella to order at a restaurant for service? It's crazy. So this is the watermelon where we've got fresh watermelon just sliced real thin, all the seeds removed. They pickled the watermelon rind today. Why waste it? It's delicious. It's a classic use for it. Some sea salt, some really good olive oil. Basil and mint, Chef? Just basil. Just basil. Just a great taste of summer. It's going to be salty, crunchy, sweet. A pickle in there for contrast. This is a Frank's prosciutto bread that's been um, it's been grilled up, slicked with a little bit of parsley pesto, and topped a little bit of our homemade bacala and cured lemon. That's the crazy fried eggplant. It's celery, speaking to its buffalo roots. It's a set menu. Everyone's getting the same thing. You can see that. That's what you signed up for. That's the adventure. All the action for the first half an hour is all the first course is coming out. The two chefs right here just pounding it out. Course after course after course. We're kind of getting to the end of that. Pretty soon the action's gonna move downstairs and some of it upstairs where we get into the main courses. The pastas, the lamb, the striped bass, the big part of the menu. But I mean, and you can see the guys doing it. These are the guys that own the joint who are cooking. Tasting everything, making sure it's perfect. You wonder why there's a lot of hype about this place and why there's a lot of buzz and why it blew up. This is why. I'm gonna eat some. See, my man's tasting stuff. This is a kitchen we like. People taste the food. I had that last night, and I did not want to share this. Did not want to share it. Okay. 
Come here. Come here. Come here. Two. So this is, again, this is the rice pudding yes. mixed with patechou, uh -huh. fried in canola oil, uh -huh. still warm, tossed in cinnamon sugar, and one of them is going to disappear yes. because yes. you have to. I showed them So what do you think? These are ridiculous. Great, thank you. How can you not like this? Really, all this great food and these great simple desserts, just like Grandma used to make if she really knew how to cook. It's a little bit of my childhood and, and, and riches. And, you know, it just it makes everybody smile. I love what those cats at Teresa are doing. You know, these two super talented kids that could be doing some fancy schmancy stuff, and it's like so bare bones simple. You come in, there's the price on the blackboard, here's what you're eating, everything's the same, two entree choices, that's it, and it was amazing. That I mean, that meal was every meal I've had there's been extraordinary. The first one especially, um, that fresh ones are relevant. They're making by hand. I mean, when do you get anything fresher than that? That place is going to change gradually. It's probably going to get a little fancier. They're probably going to up the ante. But right now, that's one of my favorite places in the city. So what do I cook after this? Well, we saw we saw a lot of you know Italian vernacular, American Italian vernacular cooking. That's what I love about what they're doing. Italian-inspired, Italian kids in America with American ingredients. So I'm going to make something that I make a lot at home that I saw on their menu. They make it, of course, differently than I do, but I love eggplant parmesan. I don't make it a lot. We're getting towards the end of the summer. Eggplant's still in season. So my eggplant parm is a real simple riff. It's pretty much how my grandmother used to make it. I kind of cut the eggplant thick because I like I like the taste of the eggplant. And the ingredients are obviously eggplant, which we're going to bread in flour and then beaten eggs with lots of basil in the eggs and some cheese in the eggs. Then we're going to layer that eggplant, which is real simple. I'm not going to make a tomato sauce because I don't need garlic. I don't need all the bells and whistles. I just need the taste of tomatoes. And for that, I'm going to use this little passata, tomato puree. If I had a glass pack passata, I would use that because it tastes like tomatoes. Good cheese, that's the other element I want. So I've got some beautiful fresh mozzarella from the market. Some. Um, Ricotta cheese from Italy, buffalo ricotta, and pecorino romano. So we're just going to start putting it together. So let's start with a nice, you can see, nice fresh eggplant straight from the Union Square market. These will be in season well into the late fall. So we're going to cut our eggplant. I usually cut it the other way, long, but because I have this shape, we're going to go with what we have. And this is the thickness I like because you know, everybody has their eggplant parmesan, a different idea of in their head where they want to go with it. I think the guys at Teresi cut theirs real, real thin. I kind of want to taste that eggplant. So it's going to be confit by the time it's done cooking. Well, you're going to see we cook it twice the way I do it, first in the saute pan and then we bake it. And I still want my eggplant intact with all that beautiful breading stuff. So that's how I cut mine, nice and thick so it tastes like eggplant. Next on the agenda is to beat some eggs. We've got some nice. Organic farm eggs here. I put a little salt in here because it just helps break them up. I put ba I sneak basil in all over this, and I'll, I'm going to put a fair amount of nice, heavy chiffonade of basil inside the um, the beaten eggs. This is pecorino cheese, so this is the Roman sheep's milk cheese. It's the cheese I prefer with tomato sauce because it's it's sharper. It's got a little more acid. I think it stands up well. That's also what I grew up eating. Uh, lastly, we're going to need some flour. In breading, in standard breading procedure, it's always flour, egg wash, and then usually breadcrumbs. And the reason flour is so important in this is because it gives the egg something to hold on to. If I just dipped my eggplant in egg, the egg would tend to slide off more. Flour gives the eggplant a bit of a coating. Let me get a pan hot. So flour, till it coats it. Get a nice coating on that, both sides into my hot pan. Same thing with the other side. Into the pan. All right, let's take a peek. Yeah, good. Nice light color. You can smell that. It's, you kind of have this wonderful marriage of fresh eggs and cheese and basil. All right, we've got the color. You see that beautiful color on both sides? Just drain them. All right, so we've got our eggplant part. And you see they're all basically cooked the same color. That's about perfectly the way I want them. They're all kind of golden brown. 
And as I mentioned, I don't need to make a tomato sauce for this because I don't want, I don't really think I need the garlic tomato-y thing. I've got a lot going on already with this. So I just got this really beautiful, thick tomato puree to work with. So now the key is to just layer these. We get the three smallest ones on the bottom. And we're gonna get a little bit of this tomato puree, not a lot. You know, if it's eggplant parmesan, I want it to taste like eggplant and not like a, a massive tomato sauce. Again, we've got some really nice fresh mozzarella. Probably a little bit too much because sometimes this stuff weeps a little. A little bit on each one. A little bit of pecorino cheese. Just get some basil. We could cut this or we could just rip it. Doesn't much matter. It's grandma style here. All right. Here we go with the next layer. Just some tomato, some pecorino cheese. Basil. And this is this lovely fresh ricotta cheese from Italy. Just gonna spoon some of this across the top. So it's gonna kind of fondue. It's my, forgive my fingers, but it's creamy. I can do it here. Okay, and we're just gonna go, oven's about 375. Let's set a timer. Figure 45 minutes. That dings, we pull it out. It should be bubbling. We'll let it cool a little bit, slice into it. And dinner. 45 minutes, we have to wait. All right, we got our eggplant parm. We let it cool a little bit again. Normally I do this in a container where it's a little more evenly shaped so it's in layers. Clearly that isn't the case here equipment failure. But you know what, it's gonna taste good. So, as is so often the case with me, taste trumps looks. We don't have food stylists. So let's just get, let's just do this. Let's take the top layer off this. Get a little bit of this cheesy goodness on there so you can look. That's the idea. See, now that, that would, I would serve it like this. It's how it's gonna eat, it's how it's gonna taste. And what you have, my idea of eggplant parm isn't some Heavy, leaden, soggy, cheesy nest. It's mostly tomato sauce, secondarily cheese, thirdly dried oregano and basil, and somewhere in there, eggplant is the forgotten vegetable. I want eggplant parm to taste like eggplant parm. I want it to almost be like a terrine. That's just me. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it this way, but that's how I like it. So let's just cut in. Hopefully this knife is sharp enough to get, get us through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. You know what, let's get a real knife in this. Sorry, boys. Yeah. That's what I meant. Now, put it back together again. I know, I've made a muck of it because it's all cheesy, but let's open it up. You can see the eggplant. See? Eggplant, little tomato, cheese, cooked. The eggplant. You could feel it, you could taste eggplant, then you taste obviously the cheese, the gratin cheese, the pecorino cheese. Mozzarella's there, but it's not a huge factor, a huge amount of basil, and even that crust from the egg. So this is my way of doing eggplant parm. It's lighter, and there's much more emphasis on, on the eggplant part of it to me. So I'll make these in like terrines at home, slice them, plunk them on the plate, Beautiful, beautiful. As a main course, as a vegetarian main course, I love it. And eggplant to me are just so, I mean, you can grill them without oiling them. That's why I've been doing them the last couple of years because they're just sponges for oil. You can grill them and they become almost puffy and cloud-like. You can bake them and they almost become like custard. Eggplant are so amazing. I think my chef friends that are like really talented friends, really talented chefs, love to play with eggplant because it's so diverse. It's like it does so many more things than the two or three that you think about. But here's my version of eggplant parm again. Mostly eggplant, cut thick. Use good cheese, use good fresh basil, just enough tomato sauce as an accent, but let the, let the egg, you can see that's like custard. Let the eggplant part of it sing. Well, let me get you a better custard shot. 
Yeah. Again, props to the guys at Teresi. I love what they're doing. I love this idea of not just Italian Americans, in this case it is Italian Americans, but of, of you know, guys like Michael White, so guys all over this country that are just getting Italian food through, a, through the American prism of American ingredients. As Italian food is a philosophy. If it's Italian, great. If it's Italian roots, great. But it's this idea of this is sort of like in their case with Teresi, this is what they grew up eating. Let's replicate that with the best ingredients we can and great standards. If you can get into that place, do so indeed. It's just super. Two young kids cooking their heart out every night, handling your food. I'll never forget that mozzarella. And then when I realized how they made it with their espresso machine by hand, just it just just born on the table. Crazy good. Eat well, see you next week. <laughs>